I mentioned earlier that one of our measures of success is the noise in the room during the break. Our second measure of success is who stays in the afternoon uh, to the end of the uh, end of the event. It looks like uh, many of you are going to stick with us. Uh, we have uh, our next panel here, uh, a sizable group uh, who are going to talk to us about infrastructure lessons learned, uh, both inside and outside the gate. We've been talking a bit about that throughout the day from both the private sector and the public sector. Uh, I think you'll find this group very uh, intriguing. Uh, our moderator is uh, Ms. Dr. Kawa Duogi, Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Resilience and Security at Norwich. Uh, as you've seen today and recognize, Norwich has been a, a great partner with us putting this event together today. So with that, over to you, ma'am. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, welcome everyone to the panel. Um, panel's called Infrastructure Lessons Learned. And after listening to all the panels before, I, I realized this is actually an extension of the second panel, the, the critical infrastructure of threats. And we were already, uh, we had a few of the topics teed up about partnerships. So we're gonna talk about that again. As you can see, we have a large panel. We have four people who've prepared some really great um, presentations for us. So I just wanna take one second or one minute to frame how how we're going to structure this so so this panel is going to highlight the innovation and best practices that these practitioners have um have experienced in their careers around um, modernization development of resilient installation infrastructure and so we'll hear about some of the challenges and opportunities both inside and outside the fence line um, that have been navigated successfully by our panelists. And uh, they're going to present it in sort of a case study. This is my professor hat on uh, sort of a case study type of framework. And we'll look at what went right, what went wrong, and how you can improve um, things. And then also, um, we'll also talk about what we need to do for the future, how to prepare for the future, how to intercept the future. We've heard a lot about how we have to prepare for the next uh, thing that we don't know uh, what that is. So we'll, I, Tom Bazzotta will talk a lot about that um, just as a preview. So without further ado, I can't turn my head without, okay, like this, um, without losing the mic. Um, first off, we have Adam Wright, um, former community planning and liaison officer, submarine uh, base, New London, United States Navy. Monica D'Angelo, director of federal partnerships at Southern Company. Um, Randy Monahan, Energy Project Officer, Public Works, uh, Marine Corps Installations Command, and Tom Bazzotta at uh, our Energy Research and Development Center, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So let's start with Mr. Wright, and I'll pass the mic. Great. Thank you, Kawa. It's just the forward. Okay. Well, uh, I'm Adam Wright. Um, my current position uh, is actually with the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation, where I am the um, uh, Defense Community Infrastructure Program Activity Lead. So I have cards if people want to talk about that after, I'd be glad to uh, be available for that. But I had the privilege of working at the submarine base New London uh, for three years as the Community Planning and Liaison Officer there. Great job, best job in the Navy, we used to say. Uh, but it, it was the uh, liais liaison with the community. And um, when Fred asked us to talk about this, it, it's just a great example. And uh, John Klein did a great example, of a great job of summarizing this. But I'll go into a, a little more detail since we have some time now. And um, you'll be available for questions, of course. But submarine base, New London, uh, you probably know uh, has uh, fast attack submarines. When they come into port, uh, they shut the, the uh, nuclear power reactor down and consume quite a bit of electricity uh, when, they're, when they're at the pier. So that, your uh, emergency operations center, your key uh, mission essential infrastructure really has to have a standalone uh, power supply. Uh, so the, the project uh, involved um, this cooperative approach that uh, really uh, has succeeded there. Um, so what you have, you have the fuel cells, John mentioned, they're on an enhanced use lease property on the installation behind the fence line. 
uh, with our security. Um, the uh, power plant it, it has been upgraded substantially uh, under an ESPC, Energy Savings Performance Contract. And, um, and the whole project is tied together with a microgrid uh, where you can see the, uh, the submarine life support and command and control aspects are on the first level uh, microgrid. Other parts of the base can be on a second level microgrid. And the vision here was for there be the microgrid to extend off base down past the PPV housing areas. Uh, where they're all off base up in New London. And the, um, and the community areas that all sailors and civilians need to access, like the gas station and the supermarket right down the street. So ultimately, and it's not there yet, but eventually all that will be built out so that the microgrid that can be powered by the uh, sub base uh, can actually um, power off base properties as well. That's all still being worked out, but that's the vision. And it's, um, it's really... Uh, it's really working so far to the extent that it's been developed. Wrong button. <laughs> okay, before I talk about how to pay for it, I think the reason this is working in New London is a sustained senior leader support and engagement, uh, as well as cross-discipline cooperation. Um, we heard the stovepipe comment before, Can't it doesn't work for this type of situation. And the reason I say sustained senior leader support and engagement, this took years to get going. Uh, four installation COs were involved in the development and through today. Um, uh, CNIC, NAVFAC headquarters, Mr. Klein, Monica at the time was there, um, all, all seeing that this could work and then seeing how it can work together. Um, state of Connecticut was key to this as well. There's a State Department of Mil Military Affairs, Mr. Bob Ross, who a lot of you know, is the executive director of that organization. Uh, he administers a $40 million bond fund that the state basically gifts to the Navy uh, to use for projects like this. And uh, so a million dollars of that fund went to the microgrid design. Um, and then you have uh, Connecticut Department of Envir uh, Energy and Environmental Protection uh, Deep came up with a five million dollar grant for the microgrid development as well. So um, you've got all these players, and then you've got got your electric utility companies, the regional cooperative, and of course uh, ISO New England, which you have to coordinate, of course, with every you're tying in power that may flow off base and get into the grid. So a lot of moving parts and a lot of expertise on a lot of different uh, people's plates. Um, probably the key things that you don't always have working together so closely are your, your EUL folks are your real estate folks, your real estate contracting officer, they call them in the Navy, um, working with your NAVFAC engineering folks to figure out how exactly all this can work. So it took a while, but they've gotten well past halfway, and uh, most of what you saw up there is now implemented. Um, in case you weren't getting how the the money works. Um, Navy didn't have to pay for either the upgrades to the power station or the uh, or the fuel cells. Uh, that's actually the beauty of this is it required very little federal or you know DOD funds to get going. Uh, the fuel cells themselves are purchased by the local cooperative, energy cooperative, and they get paid back by billing for the power. So they'll bill us for our power. If power gets shifted off base, uh, they can bill for that as well. Um, the ESPC is uh, $80 million of investment by a company, in this case, Noresco, uh, who will recoup their funds based on the savings generated. So no upfront cost to the Navy except to adapt to what they're doing on base. And then, um, and then they, you know, that company makes their profit by, uh, you know, basically $7 million a year in savings over the course of so many years. Uh, and the state is a grant and gifts. So that's how the money can work in something like this, but it requires a lot of people talking and moving in the same direction for a long time. And this is just a, some of the points on that um, way to accomplish greater goals. But uh, that, I'll leave it for there and we'll wait for questions after that. All right, looks like I'm up next. 
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monica D'Angelo. I am the Director of Federal Partnerships for Southern Company. Um, I, it's great to see many uh, familiar faces finally in person after so many years. So uh, uh, what is a Director of Federal Partnerships? I guess I'll start there. Uh, that role has been described internally as a Rosetta Stone. Um, which I take great pride in. And as a quick aside, I will say I fondly attribute that professional accomplishment to the Army because many, many years ago, uh, when I was an analyst uh, working for the program manager for Mobile Electric Power, uh, my boss and I went into a room. It was my very first military engagement at the time. He said, just, just listen and write down you know, acronyms or words or phrases that you don't understand, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Uh, so the premise that we were there to talk about was uh, consolidation of gen sets at forward operating bases, uh, reducing the fuel convoy, the logistics convoy, and also in parallel analyzing the fully burdened cost of fuel to reduce that uh, in, in parallel with the logistics chain. So very exciting, right? Uh, I walk out of the meeting. Uh, my boss looked at me. I had a legal notebook, two and a half full pages of acronyms. And he looked at that, looked at me, and he said, Godspeed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, upon reflection, right, uh, and and being part of such a, a great uh, effort, right, I we were also part of the execution, and I I really applaud the profound execution of the army at that time, and how quickly they they enacted the results of that study to to achieve you know, a reduction, true reductions, um, saving lives, of course, uh, of the, you know, the convoys that needed to protect that logistics tail as well. They executed in under 12 months. Uh, we, we got real time results of, of how that was working. And I, and I reflected after some further uh, experience and exposure in my prior role with the Navy, um, how was it that, that, the Army was able to execute that so quickly. And I, I couldn't recall ever seeing a contracting officer or acquisition council sitting around the table and was thinking, huh, that, wonder if that ever had something to do with it. Um, in all seriousness, though, I, I will say that I had the pleasure of working with some uh, very, very uh, forward-leaning and very, um, very smart KOs and contract uh, acquisition council in my Navy experience. And I, I bring this back to the definition of, of partnerships and leveraging partnerships for innovation in infrastructure at an installation level, because there's many, many examples of how partnerships do achieve innovation in infrastructure. Uh, it shouldn't be like finding a needle in a haystack, though. And uh, I think we were able to accomplish a lot of great things. Um, and in doing so, we brought awareness, right? Awareness to what partners and the definition of partnership and what those partners could bring to the table. Um, so, so on this, this slide, really, it's, it's a means of me being a Rosetta Stone um, and trying to bring some awareness to what utility partners can bring to the table uh, that may or may not be known to many to many folks, certainly in this room or you know across the services. Um, first and foremost, it, it's utilities' uh, ability to operate in both regulated and unregulated spaces, and having different businesses that give them the experience internal to the company that then they can pass along to their customers. Um, Southern has a, a very robust R&D arm uh, that does a lot of government research and development, um, but puts that into practice through some of our commercialization. Uh, we just uh, went COD on two very large batteries. One was 80, 88 megawatts and the other was 72 to support the California ISO. Um, we have an unregulated subsidiary that was uh, the microgrid um, installer for MCAS Yuma. Uh, premier Marine Corps and DOD microgrid. Uh, and we just completed a research study for Naval Station Mayport uh, that analyzed the um, full base resilience uh, requirements to support 
both uh, climate impacts as well as full electrification um, and supporting certain mission requirements they, that they could not otherwise achieve holistically had they not found an R&D partner. Um, so I say this because many people think of, you know, certainly Southern Company is just operating in, you know, the Southeast footprint, but the experience that leveraging a utility partner brings to the table is, is much more and can be much more robust. <clears throat> So bringing it back to a few examples within our footprint, right? Um, we have both uh, electric operating companies and natural gas uh, um, LDCs. And a lot of great examples throughout our footprint of, of true partnerships with, with the services, right? Key number one uh, single customer within you know, our, our operating footprint. Um, and for that reason, we assembled a federal team that shares best practices, recognizing that there are, you know, communication boundaries, some challenges associated with contracting across the services, and just by, you know, doing business with DOD uh, in general. So what we bring to the table, try to as a team all the time, is, is to transcend those, those challenges and those barriers. Um, across our footprint and to, to the customers. So um, when we were working, when I form a role uh, on the enhanced use leasing, right? And, and John Klein and Randy were instrumental here in making those deals happen. Uh, finding a utility partner who is willing to lean forward in effectively uh, building a generation asset you know, on DOD property uh, and rate basing that was was really innovative and forward leaning. Uh, what, what I'm trying to do now is, OK, we've got these generation assets that have been rate based and are being paid for. How can how can the military fully leverage those? That is phase two of the partnership. And we've got great examples at, you know, at Kings Bay. We've got a great example at Robbins Air Force Base, um, Fort Rucker, Fort Benning, Fort Gordon. Um, all with very unique mission requirements where we're trying to identify using that regulated asset through the partnership uh, to bring enhanced resilience to actual resilience, actual reliability um, that means something to the customer, but also provides grid stability and, um, and, and load management from the utility perspective. And that to me is a win-win, it is a true partnership, and it is a, a great way to leverage any servicing utility partner that, that has those opportunities to offer. Um, I guess the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, something that working with your utility company brings to bear that may not be as, you know, uh, as forthright is, is our ability to be part of multiple conversations at, at every level, right? On the Hill, at the headquarters departmental level, influence legislation, policy and guidance that, that actually translates into meaningful gifts from Congress, right? That, that can give DOD tools in the toolbox that, um, or amend them to work in a more holistic way. As an example, uh, Naval Submarine Base Kings Bay came to uh, George Power Company, said, hey, we want to talk about holistic resilience. First thing our folks said was, well, what define holistic resilience? Because, you know, typically we're only looking inside the fence. Georgia Power has a requirement through the FAST Act to ensure resilience outside the fence line for critical infrastructure. And so that in and of itself provided a very safe space to have a discussion holistically about requirements that didn't stop at the fence line, where your utility partner has a requirement to ensure reliability and resilience um, and support national requirement, national security requirements. And then lastly, tactical execution of, of partnerships, right, to a utility company, um, because we all know that at the end of the day, a partnership, it can be an MOA, it can be an MOU, but if you talk to a, a KO or acquisition council, they will say it's a contract. And, and so how do you actually put that into execution? There is, you know, the GSA area-wide contract is a great vehicle. Um, I will stand up here and tell you in my prior role, I was a naysayer. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, it wasn't clear on the value that it brought. And, and very quickly, I will tell you that, uh, had we known today the value of an area-wide contract and the true partnership it brings to the table, meaning 
a, a safe space to talk about requirements openly with your, your servicing utility partner because you're under privity of contract, long-term privity of contract. Um, we could have connected those jet rate-based generation assets to the installation all in one fell swoop. Um, now, now we're on phase two, lesson learned, but great thing to think about as we're moving forward, thinking through, you know, climate uh, resilience, reliability requirements with servicing utility partners. Um, and there's a whole host of uh, other opportunities to, to leverage this contract to, to meet both mission uh, and um, to meet mission goals as, as well as plan for the future. It looks like I'm the token Marine, by the way. There we go. Um, obviously, we are much smaller than, um, than the Army, and uh, which is good and bad. Um, I guess the good part is we can get things done pretty quickly because we're a very small unit, and sometimes there's only one or two people that make the decisions. So I love my job because as an action officer up at headquarters Marine Corps, I pretty much get to tell myself what to do. And let me explain that. <laughs> okay. I manage, I budget, and I fund all the projects coming up to headquarters Marine Corps. Now, I came from the installation, so I know what they need. I've got 20 years plus Marine Corps experience of active duty, so I, I know what we need. So when I go back out to the installations, I say, you know, this is still isn't fixed. That's not fixed. This isn't fixed. So I can relate to the operators, to the maintainers, to everybody. So what I do up there is I leverage every single asset I can. I use appropriated dollars as much as I can because it's shame on us for not bringing appropriated dollars to third-party financing, by the way. I'm going to put that up front. If we don't do that to get resilience, some, we're, not, we're not doing it right. I'm going to tell you, that's how we were able to do it for the last 10 years. And you're going to see some of the projects that were able to bring some appropriated dollars and make it, make it worth it. Um, so I get to leverage appropriated dollars, ESPCs, UESCs, PPAs, uh, energy mill cons, right? EULs. So you have to think, you know, like, like an area planner. You have to look at a bigger picture than just look at just that one building you have to look at the campus wide. So that's kind of the, that's, that, that's the neat part about my job is I work with the installation and energy managers because I was one. So it's neat to be able to go, let's fix that, let's do that. So let's go back to 2011. Where was everybody in 2011? Anybody in Southern California at that time? What happened? What ha we got a hand. Well, okay, Mick, yeah, <laughs> you were with me at that time. So, uh, that's not fair. Uh, anybody else? Because you know exactly where I'm coming with this one. What's next? What, uh, what happened back that, at that time in Southern California? Now, they always have fires. Camp Pendleton is always, always on fire. I mean, besides that. So we had a regional blackout. If you remember, we had a regional blackout, and it took out Southern California. So I'm the energy manager. And my boss goes, what the hell happened? I don't know. You know, well, call sdg and &E. I'm calling up. He goes, I don't know. So here we are at 3 o'clock and no power, nobody. I'm calling everybody else on the phones going, hey, what's going on with you guys? So the problem is I'm on an air station, right? We call the ops. What's going on? Hey, you got power? No. The gates are closed to the air station. You can't. They're all electric. So... <laughs> Right, you can't even get on and off the air station, right? Uh, the security areas. So then we have what was the other thing? Oh, get, talked about gas stations, right? So anybody that didn't fill up their gas tank <laughs> needed a ride home. By the way, I, I, I shuttled a few people back and forth, so no gas. Let's, let's talk about generators. How many generators really worked? Because when we do our generators, we do not do a full load test. We only do, we turn it on, the maintenance guys comes in, it runs it. I'm watching him going, you're not going to do a full load test? Oh, no, no, we're good. Man, that's scary. So we started implementing more load testing. Okay. And then we talked to ops and said, well, what's going on? We're bringing all the aircraft home. Wow, okay. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's maybe an hour, an hour, no problem, right? We brought all the aircraft home. And then second, we said, you know what? 
everybody go home. We'll, we'll figure this out tomorrow. So we sent everybody home. Well, it lasted a couple of days. So you got to figure out that's not the right answer. So when, when I met with the CO a couple of days later for after action report, he looked at me, I said, I got a plan. He said, we need to be energy, energy independent. And we didn't talk about resiliency back then because I don't think that it was a word back then. It was security or independence. So we said, we're going to put something together. So my colleague, Mick Wasco, since you, you know, put your hand up there, he'll be talking about one of the projects at Miramar that we moved forward with the microgrid. But up at headquarters Marine Corps, I looked at it a little differently. And I'm going to ask you to change this because I'm not going to touch that thing. Um, sorry. In the back. I, yeah, there we go. So to give you a quick idea, a snapshot of where all, all the Marine Corps bases are, because I'm, I'm sure that you're like, well, I, since I'm the token Marine, you might not know where all those locations are. Um, so the interesting part about that is we started looking at logistically which base and, oh, by the way, the energy managers, because back then it was like, who's the more aggressive energy manager? We needed that champion that we've always talked about. So a lot of this earlier stuff was done because you had a motivated energy manager. And, oh, by the way, if you had somebody at the headquarters to say, how much money you need? Yeah, we'll do that too. Because that was the key part about moving acquisition money. So next one, please. So this is what we've done already. So we'll take the top. So we, we always like to try to always outdo everybody else. We don't always get to do that. But for the least for the Marine Corps, we did the largest ESPC at Paris Island. If, if you don't know what Paris Island does, we make Marines. So we completely, I, I laugh at this one. We island the island, right? That's funny. We island the island, right? So we have the capability. We went through a third party financing. Now we did have a big elephant in the room. We had a steam plant that we were able to decommission. That's that brings revenue, so we can use that. But you can see up there on the right hand side that we did. You no, know, we got we got redundancy up to fourteen plus days. Is that the answer? I would say that that's the best we can do with what we have on site. You know, fuel not trying to truck it in. We talked about let's, lessons learned. We're going to make sure that we have enough on-site as possible. Then we were down at Albany. There, there are some 14 days off the grid with some landfill power and some co-generation. And then, and then we've heard about the Yuma. So I've tried to use third-party financing, e-wells and everything. So Yuma was a perfect example of working with the utility. It was a huge need. So right next to the existing substation, we put a, okay, it's diesel. Okay, got it. But we put a huge power plant right there. Now, the, the issue we had, and a lot of people said, well, okay, you know what, what happens inside the fence? What if one of our Marines get drunk and hits the pole? I said, well, had the Marine fix the pole. You know, that was the joke because, well, you know, we, we can do that. So in, in let's see, we put this in 16? In 2016, we've probably been off the grid because if we had uh, frequency events or power went down over 200 times. We have a joint strike fighter there, and we have never gone down. Okay, goodness gracious. We've never gone down. It just kicks up. The generation kicks up, and nobody knows we're off the grid. So this is the top partnership you need to work with, with your, your utility to say, if there's a win-win, Let's not use the money that we have for a lot of the financing. If I so lessons learned, I'd probably do a heck of a lot, in which we are. We're going to do a, we're doing a lot more enhanced use leases. I'm going to save Miramar for last. Um, 29 Palms. We have uh, I think that was probably uh, the earlier part when we did a very large ESPC um, co generation. We had my, uh, we had uh, so Milcon came in and merged them together. So. Again, all these efforts that we have, we're trying to take the entire base off the grid. Now, there are some pro and cons to that. People are going to go, why did you do that? You should be able to look at just maybe a certain certain uh, critical assets. Well, hard to, it's hard when you've got critical assets all over the base. So anyway, our approach at that time that I convinced my boss, we were going to look at a base-wide effort. Um, We're going to go on to other ones. Um, we're going to do Japan and, and some of the other installations. 
But that's that's exactly what our outcome. That's how we're trying to uh, address resiliency. And I'm going to throw a a uh, promo to my energy manager, Mick Wasco. On my next slide, this is exactly how working with the utility works out because they were able to push power back out to the grid during a, during a uh, critical time. If we could just hit this next one. Electricity as a utility is something that's extremely vulnerable because it's completely interconnected around the United States. Our goal is to not rely on that infrastructure but have a redundancy that gives us resilience as an air station to respond to any sort of emergency where we would be out of power. We're able to power the base for up to 21 days based on on-site renewable and conventional resources. The renewable energy sources that we have on station are mostly from methane gas at the landfill. We also have it from solar, and we also have battery storage. Millions could have lost power in rolling blackouts across California. During the heat wave, we were able to support the grid by turning on our microgrid, and we were able to directly contribute to reducing the number of rolling blackouts that were seen in the region. The microgrid here has enabled other military installations that are working on these technologies to reduce dependence on fossil fuels and conventional resources. All right, I'll pass the buck. Good afternoon. Um, for me, this is kind of the perfect storm. It's been at least two years since I've talked in front of a large crowd, forgot how intimidating that can be. Um, add to that, um, I feel like I'm in a candy store. I love the conversation that's been going on so far. Um, and lastly, I have one of these, hence the perfect storm. Um, so what do I do? I do microgrids, both mobile for tactical purposes and fixed installations. Um, from where I sit, there's all kinds of opportunities for modernizing the installations, but using some of the technologies that have been developed for the tactical side. Um, the key is we're playing a three-dimensional chess game. Most of you are familiar with policy, so let's say that's the top tier, most attention on that, followed by the next tier, which is your funding and the things that funding will buy under normal processes, and then technology. Uh, you tend to overlook that bottom tier quite a bit. So, so what is technology doing? And, and that really is what I want to do today is, is I, I want to help you see the problem differently, but also the opportunity space differently. Because most in the room are dealing with the day-to-day -day fight of just doing business that has to be done. And you lose that ability to see the art of the possible. So if we can share the art of the possible a little bit. I think you'll see it's it's much more interesting than you may realize. Okay, so um, this is a weird statement, maybe a little bit provocative. Uh, in the past, operational energy was distinctly different from installation energy. In fact, at OSD, there were two separate food chains, and I often got in trouble for being in the wrong one. Operational energy, low voltage, mobile, Installation energy, medium voltage, and um, fixed. Well, is that true? Installation energy, if you have a backup generator, odds are that backup generator is going to be a low voltage generator. Um, medium voltage for your distribution, got that. On the tactile side, many people think about uh, the TQG or, or the AMPS, the, the current program of record generator. And it's low voltage, but there's also the prime power, which is medium voltage. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is there's not a clear cut line between one and the other. And if this is true, can we think about the problem differently? So I drew an artificial line there, and that line represents a food chain. Is this coming out of the Army Futures Command for the, the force, or is this coming out of the G9 more targeted at the installations? 
but the technologies don't care. And I want to emphasize that point. The technologies don't care. We at the URTIC, we have a robust insulation energy program, and, and we also have an operational energy program. I'm the oddball that has a, a foot in both doors. So if we're going to move forward in contested logistics, if we're really serious about creating um, a seamless capability from, from the installation to the foxhole, if we're going to start using advanced technologies to include electric vehicles, then we've, we've got to start blending and taking advantage of core capabilities. And then how do I take that core capability and turn it into a specific end use application? For example, uh, the inverter. The inverter is probably the most critical new technology that, that, that's coming down the road. And that technology is needed for your electric vehicles, for your energy storage, for uh, changing uh, power from one voltage to another. It's, it's actually the, the, probably the, the most interesting uh, potential vulnerability in any electrical space, whether it's military, civilian, uh, tactical, or installation. So not wanting to talk too much, these are some of the technologies that are ongoing um, that you may not be aware of. Um, the digital twin technologies, that's actually a project that, that I lead. And we're looking at how can we rapidly create a digital twin of an installation. If I can do that for an installation, I can do the same thing for a contingency base that operates at, low, at medium voltage, as well as um, high utilization bases, your hubs that are closer to the fight uh, that may use mixed voltages. Uh, with a digital twin, I can go in and establish um, what you actually have on the ground. So that, that literally means documenting all of your assets and doing an assessment of, of how healthy they are. And then we run models and simulations to determine how healthy is that infrastructure. Um, some of the earlier work done shows that, that most older building transformers are at capacity today. But do you know that? Um, that's an important question I would wanna know. Um, another one is electric vehicles. Um, what happens if, if I go to uh, any installation's government quarters uh, and each of those occupants gets one small electric vehicle? You've probably busted the circuit going into housing, whether it's because it's trying to pull too much power or because it's now out of phase. Uh, and the, the same applies for any community. That, that's gonna be a problem we haven't thought about. What happens if we go in and we build tactical vehicles that are all electric? Has anyone thought about how much charging rate you need for a tactical vehicle? The estimate today for a 15 minute charge, which is a long time on the battlefield, is 1.5 megawatts of power. If you start putting tactical vehicles, electric tactical vehicles in your motor pool, how are you gonna support the power need for those vehicles? So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is without understanding our current capabilities, without being able to forecast future requirements and doing honest to God uh, math-based simulation, then you're not gonna know where your, your points of failure are gonna be. And the interesting news for me is if we're really going to build microgrids at all Army installations by 2035, and we're going to incorporate electric vehicles, we can solve both problems at the same time. So that's a true, true opportunity to, to really get Army installations um, to the capabilities that they need to get. Um, hardware advances. The, the reason hardware advances and power electronic advances are there there's tremendous efforts taking place across the DOD labs, across the government labs, but more importantly, across industry. And we need the ability to tap into these things. Um, that bullet in the middle, open interoperability standards. There's this really cool thing that exists today called the tactical microgrid standard. Uh, it's in the middle of that approval process to become a mill standard. It's currently slated for tactical ground power. So it's TMS, TGP. 
but it doesn't care if it's low voltage for mobile applications or fixed at installations. We have other projects that are looking to employ the tactile microgrid standard open architecture at, uh, at our installations. Uh, we're one contract away from getting the first one on the ground. What, is, what does TMS allow you to do? It's, it allows for modularity, for scalability, because it's a plug and play architecture. If I'm on the battlefield and, and I plug in two generators and I plug in a third or even a vehicle, the controller will automatically say, well, who are you? There's an interrogation, same thing that happens when you plug your USB into your computer. Okay, I know who you are, what you're supposed to do, and it allows you in the grid. So literal plug and play. So for an installation, what that means is any new technology that you bring in can be plugged into that grid once it's accommodated into the TMS architecture and it doesn't require a lot of extensive re-engineering and it, it doesn't care what vendor you are if, if it does that. Um, the partnerships. Partnerships are critical. They're an enabler for finding solutions. The partnership itself is not a solution. It's what the partnership can do. And those, we don't have the processes necessarily to optimize our ability to tap into what, what industry is doing, what academia is doing, uh, let alone the other government labs. Um, that's a bit of a challenge as well. And then lastly, where are we going with all of this? Uh, we coined this phrase uh, three or four years ago, universal battlefield power. A commander goes on the battlefield and he can use whatever sort of power is available, whether it's traditional generators, commercial generators, host nation power, renewables, harvestable energy. It should not matter at some point in the future. Uh, what can we do today under this construct? Um, we have uh, DC microgrids that are vehicle based. Um, a vehicle that is outfitted uh, especially to produce exportable power, 120 kilowatts. Um, we have um, our low voltage microgrids. We're working on the medium voltage and then the mixed voltage, both low and medium voltage. Um, and then let's combine those two things together. So we have vehicles and traditional generators together on the same microgrid. Um, starting to look at cogeneration. Um, energy storage of all sorts, renewables, um, alternative fuels, hydrogen is very promising in the future. And then again, to be able to tap into host nation power. Um, I've got bi-directional electric and autonomous vehicles highlighted. Again, that's a real game changer in ways that, that we just don't understand yet. We haven't fully looked at the ripples across the pond that those are gonna bring. And with that, Kyle, I'll turn it back to you. All right. It was, we're, we're almost out of time, but um, do I have, have the two minutes? Yeah. So uh, I just want to end really quickly with each panelist um, telling me what, what, if you could say one thing, one area we need to improve to be ready for the future. I'm, I'm just going to pass that down and then we'll wrap up there. So. Okay. Well, I think uh, from my perspective, it's the cross-discipline cooperation and uh, sustains senior leader support and engagement can over time because some of these projects take a long time to bring to fruition. Uh, I'll say for me, uh, certainly what Adam mentioned, but also holistic resilience and leveraging, you know, that cross-discipline collaboration also with, you know, your external partners um, that that truly that have the same alignment to priorities as as you do, right? To bring uh, to ensure security, reliability, resilience, you know, at at good pricing um, or affordable pricing, um, but achieving it, you know, in a in a mutually beneficial way. I'm going to go back off of what you said here. It, it's informing our change of command. Because what happens is we all, we've been there, we've seen the change of command uh, every couple of years gets rotated out, we get some new folks in there and priorities change. And we all know this through the administration and, and we've gone from efficiency to you know, resiliency, projects or things have changed. So we just need to make sure and get the top cover that we need. That's how I would do it. So that would be my, my, my two cents is I, I, I inform my CG, uh, on a monthly basis, what we're doing, and here's the importance, and I just make sure that he's 
he's well aware of you know our, our priorities and make sure it's it's his priorities too or vice versa his priorities are my priorities so sorry mine's pretty simple manpower we don't have enough energy and power professionals at installations or within the tactical army all right well thanks to the panel and uh it was really great really informative thanks for all your Okay, could we get the last panel to come on up? Jeff, bring your bring your team up, please. The hardcore have stayed to the bitter end here. And I, I know there was a lot of information in that last panel. I hope you can grab uh, some of the speakers afterward if you had some questions for them. Uh, they had a lot of information to pass to us.